everyone. Welcome to the um, last session of the day, um, which will be on face surveillance on current status and future action. Please take a seat in the room. There's still some space in the front. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Estelle Massé. I'm a senior policy analyst at Access Now, which is an international um, NGO. I'd first like to thank uh, Epic and in particular Mark Rodenberg for putting together um, this panel and this session together and already making an early announcement that right after this session there will be the Epic Award in this room. So please make sure to stay um, after the session. Now going into the session, we have a great lineup of speakers here today to discuss face surveillance and in particular the policy and regulatory development in this area. You may have seen that there is a lot of discussion on what we call face surveillance but others call facial recognition at this conference and we want to have a discussion here with the panel but also with all of you in the room on the, on the proposal on regulation that we've already seen coming up quite a little bit. Um, we, you will see that our panel will also give an overview, not just uh, for Europe, but for um, a, a lot of different places around the world, um, as this is an opportunity here, in, uh, here for CPDP to see what uh, several regions have been doing um, on this issue, even though we've been having a lot of discussion um, also in the EU. Um, we, when we talk about um, phase surveillance, you will hear a lot the word banned and moratorium. Actually, we, um, as civil society, also came up for, um, for a call for a moratorium on the use of um, these technologies for mass surveillance purposes. And this declaration um, that we, uh, many of us, more than hundreds of us, um, signed around the Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioner in Tirana in October was an initiative by EPIC and supported by a lot of us here. So civil society has been quite vocal in asking for a ban, but we're also seeing some government now starting thinking um, about this option. I'm just gonna for a minute step out of my role as moderator be before giving the floor to our panelists to just give a little note on the EU side being the only uh, representative from the European Union on this session to say that there has been a lot of talks um, on the basis of a leak that was um, released just a, um, a few days ago from the AI white paper of the EU Commission that seem to be indicating that the EU were thinking of banning facial recognition for three to five years. If we look at the leak in more detail, it actually also come to the conclusion that a ban is not the preferred option of the EU and they want to uh, focus more on enforcement of the general data protection regulation. But it's interesting to see that this word is being um, considered by lawmakers, even though for now, at least in the EU, it seems that uh, we're not taking the direction of a ban. Okay, coming back to my moderator role, um, we have a great panel today and we'll start right now with our first speaker, Valeria Milanes, who works for the Asociación por Derechos Civiles in Argentina. And um, she will talk uh, through um, first the general issue that we experience with facial um, recognition technology and some interesting cases coming um, from her country. Thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you, Esté. Thank you, Epic. Thank you, my colleagues in the panel. And thank you, all of you, for being here. I know it's, there, there were several panels related facial recognition. Indeed, it's something that it's kind of interrupt us, erupt us. And it's our duty <laughs> to discuss this and to put this right. Because we, in, in the organization, um, like Estelle says, I will say it in English, is Association for Civil Rights. It's this year we are uh, celebrating our 25th year old, so it's a traditional civil rights and human rights organization, but we're starting to work on digital issues. And one of the things that we were studying the last four or five, five years really hard was the use of biometric data in general, not only in Argentina, but also in the region. And one of the things that we were studying is the use by the national governments related to different kind of services that the government provides. So we were deeply working on that. And last year in April, the city of Buenos Aires government announced that they will deploy a facial recognition system for security reasons on the public transportation system in Buenos Aires. So 
We, uh, and the system starts to work in later April that year. They deploy, there are 10,000 camera, cameras on, for surveillance on the CCTV system that the city has. And this facial recognition uh, software um, deploys randomly over 300 of them. And matches uh, using the biometric data of the National People Registry that it's, um, it has information, biometric information for around 40 million of us, Argentinians, and compares that biometric data with a registry, a national registry for people who is looking by the justice, people that is considered rebel. This base, which is not biometric, it's our only names, is around 50,000 people. So, this is the information that we have originally. We, at the next day that this, the, this, uh, this uh, activity from the woman was announced, we in introduced a um, request for public information because we need to understand what was the diagnosis for adopting this technology that because of our work in biometrics, we know that it was pretty much invasive to the privacy and to the personal data of, the, of every individual. They answer us after a request for, for some more days that the law gives to them to answer. The first answer was not enough. At this point, the system was running and we put another FOIA request and they give more information but not sufficient for us. But we were able in October, so take, a, take, take, uh, take notice the time, to introduce in front of the uh, Superior Court of the City of Buenos Aires a legal action claiming the inconstitutionality, the non-constitutionality of the system. Some of the things that we can collect, and this is related to the topic that Estelle pointed uh, about policy and about regulation, is that like we had noticed uh, regarding biometrics, but in this case in more severe way, the uh, normative that um, put in action this surveillance uh, technology, it was not a law, it was not a proper law uh, by the legislative power, it was not a decree which is the um, maximum normative power that executive power have, it was a resolution given by a ministry, by a, a minister of security. So take into account the, the level in the, in the legal pyramid that uh, decide the implementation of this system. That one thing. Another thing that it, the argumentation and the uh, rationale provided in this resolution it was sustained on basically on the uh, CCTV surveillance system using all the considerations related to an image that is what the CCTV takes for justifying the use of this invasive technology which have a different technical connotation beyond an image. The, like, Maybe if you, you were participating in the previous panel and you f are following the topic, you know that facial recognition generates new information, compares, identifies people, tracks people, is not taking an image like the CCTV system are think of. So we uh, notice this. Uh, of course, our claim have more legal um, considerations. I am focusing on these ones. And also, we put into the radar of the justice, the superior justice, uh, the, the court superior justice for the city of Buenos Aires, that it's not only privacy what is involved, it's data protection, being biometric data, is most sensitive personal data which have very specific protections under the Argentinian law that is inspired in the previous uh, uh, regulation that was here in Europe. So it has similarities. And uh, privacy in general, 
we have to highlight that because at least in Argentina, and I'm, uh, I can say that in Latin America, courts have not expressed themselves so much about the extent of privacy. That is not um, a right that had been challenged so much in court. So we had to put to the eyes, in front of the eyes of the court, the current meanings of privacy. It's not only my space and I can decide, it has to be with my autonomy, it has to be with my very self, and that is, does not depend if I am indoors or outdoors. It's related to me, my dignity, my freedom, my determination. So, um, we are hoping, we, we are waiting right now that the court that is in recess, uh, you have to take into account that in Argentina we are in a very hot summer, so we are in a summer re legal research, we, research, recess, sorry. We are waiting for the court to admit our claim and have the chance to debate this publicly because if we were not being able to, to pursue that FOIA request and to put that claim, absolutely no one would have think about the implications of the technology. Not the public, because it's um, the general public is not in the duty of, the, of doing this assessment at the very first moment. Not even the, the authorities that implemented the facial recognition system have idea of what exactly they were implementing. Nor the judges, nor the legislators that have no award on this, so we hope, and that is why I started claiming for it is our duty to talk about this and to put on the table what is at stake, no matter what. We hope that we can give that discussion um, properly in front of the justice, like we are intended to, because it will help not only debates here that maybe have another particularities, but also in Latin America as a whole. So I think I could uh, close here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria. I think the example you just put forward shows that how much in the case of the deployment of face recognition, the discussion on any possible regulation on how to use it actually comes after the fact that it's been used and it's only through transparency measures and access to information measures that you've, you thankfully are using that you actually find out what's happening, which is a uh, it's well not the best way to um, approach the discussion on, on, on regulation in particular when we're talking about such sensitive topic, uh, which is a little bit on what you're going to be um, touching, uh, Lorraine, who's our next speaker, uh, who's the chair of the ASM Global Technology and Policy Council and from um, Purdue University in the United States. Uh, you will be um, walking us through a little bit the uh, sensitive component of those technology and what are the risks and how it relates to, to human rights. Thank you very much for being here. So thank you, Estelle, and the rest of the panel, and for those of you who are here. Um, just a quick check, can you hear me in the back? Yes, okay, great, thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, a quick introduction, I'm wearing two hats here. First is in my role um, with ACM as chair of the Technology Policy Council. And ACM is a professional society of computer scientists, and they have a long history, at least in the US, and growing in, the, in Europe in terms of being uh, providers of expert information to policymakers in about technology policy. And so um, I will, during the discussion, maybe have an opportunity to mention some of the statements that we have released in the last three years regarding privacy, security, artificial intelligence, or algorithmic accountability. Um, I'm also here in a role of representing the um, newly revised code of ethics that ACM has put out as a professional society. And last, um, I hope to be able to speak a little bit about my involvement last year through the Epic Privacy Center in terms of helping to um, create the universal guideline for AI. So that's my standard. But what I want to start first to talk about um, the social science, if you will, of based surveillance and talk about some of the technological issues, what's unique about facial recognition based surveillance technologies. Um, some of these statistics 
that underlies some of the issues and the concerns and some of the social and political risk and consequences that come from this. So uh, first, let me um, start with brief definitions because facial recognition and face surveillance are two different things. And I want to be clear, at least from my standpoint, how I'm defining this. So a facial recognition system is intended or expected to be using biometric data. And that biometric data is used to map features of the faces. And it's matched against a data set that um, is then intended to suggest that there's a known match between something in the database and something that's there. So a match is defined statistically and generally is based upon a threshold that's set. And that threshold is arbitrary. It could be that this particular system in context indicates that the threshold might be 70% of the data is similar and therefore constitutes a match. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and of course, biometric data refers to anything that uh, draws from biometric processes or elements. Samples, models, finger, fingerprints, iris scans, and so forth. But it can be physiological, but it can also be behavioral. And when we talk about face surveillance, it's important to keep in mind the behavioral elements of biometric data. And then last, face surveillance, of course, is a particular implementation of face recognition, recognition technology by government or institutional powers and generally used to identify and when we're talking about surveillance, track and monitor um, citizens and members of its institutions. So a face surveillance system uh, includes many different elements. It can include at a basic level recognition and identification of a facial image. It can include and does include the aggregation of data that allows you to match an image to or um, a behavioral pattern. It includes pattern recognition algorithms. It includes surveillance and tracking and monitoring over different points of time, an individual or a group of um, individuals to understand uh, and collect data about their behaviors. And most importantly, it includes prediction and attempts to predict the behaviors of individuals that it is tracking or an attempt to predict emotion, for example, of individuals that are being surveilled. There are some unique risks about face recognition systems um, and face surveillance systems that I want to call out because some may ask, isn't this just another element of artificial intelligence and why is the conversation any different? So first, because the face is biometric, as a biometric identifier, it's uniquely identifiable. It's highly sensitive and it's difficult to secure. And of course, it's immutable. Generally, it can't be changed. Although you may wear a mask, you may have some facial adjustments, surgical adjustments to your face, generally it's immutable. There are also inaccuracies involved in any kind of statistical algorithm that attempts to recognize, match, and so forth, depending upon the data sets that are used in that process. There are limitations in the prediction algorithms, um, including false matches, inaccurate thresholds, inappropriate thresholds, you might say, and lack of external validity, which I'll mention uh, in just a second. But in terms of predicting behavior, there's a huge leap that comes from predicting an image match, a still image match, and predicting behavior over time, patterns of um, behavioral elements and data. So specifically, what I want to say that's unique about face surveillance that calls for us to address and consider whether our principles and our laws and our governance is appropriately covering those areas is that is continuous. Generally, we're not talking about a single point of time of capturing a face to recognize it in order to access and open up your device. We're talking about continuous sets of data, which means we have more data and more powerful sets of profiles of an individual. Second, it's invisible, which means that it generally removes the knowledge as well as the consent process that we traditionally have relied upon in terms of privacy principles. Um, and third, it's automatic, 
the determinations and the decisions that are made about individuals based upon the surveillance practice are generally automated through the algorithms and the predictions that are made there. And so there's a lack. It removes human determination from the process. It removes consent and choice and due process at a particular point. So a couple of things about the statistics. Um, without throwing anybody off who doesn't like the word statistics. It's really important when we talk about the principles and laws and governing behind that, that we pay attention to the accuracy, the quality, the reliability, and the validity of the data and the algorithms that are being used. Most of us know what quality is. And when we talk about images, we can all uh, realize that we may have blurry images. We may have uh, low resolution images. We may have incorrect images, something, a picture of myself or a caption of me thinking it's me. And it may be a sister who looks very similar to me or something like that. And we have the problem of insufficient distinctions, particularly uh, on algorithms and machine learning processes that have been trained upon a limited set of data. And so this is when we come up with questions of bias and discrimination based upon race or gender, because it doesn't, the algorithm or the training process has not been sufficiently trained on a, a representative enough sample. And then last, we have predictive accuracy of the models themselves. And I mentioned before thresholds. Um, and the fact that they really need to be specific to the context. So for example, when I use a model as a research person to try to indicate and explain behavior that we have seen and we've collected data about, if I get 65% accuracy um, and correlation in there, I'm pretty happy. Because from a research standpoint, that's a pretty strong ability to predict based upon that data. But if I'm using this in a criminal justice environment, and with the decision to make a determination about whether or not somebody will stay longer in prison or receive a longer sentence and so forth. 65% accuracy is not sufficient in that particular context. So the thresholds are really important to pay attention to in this. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. It's also really important to talk about the fact that statistics, when we talk about these predictive algorithms, many of them are based simply on correlations. And for those of you who have taken a statistics or a method, research methods class in our college, you will always hear the phrase that a correlation is not causation. So simply correlating behavioral determinants of an individual's body is not sufficient to say that, therefore, I can predict that they're likely to be a criminal. I can predict that they're likely to be involved in terrorist activity. So that important caveat about correlation is not causation is very important to keep in mind. And we have historical precedences which have indicated the dangers of using um, the assumption that we might be able to predict intelligence and other kinds of behavior based upon the size of one's skull or something like this. So this is a really important caveat to keep in mind in terms of the assumptions that are made with predictive algorithms. I think I've run out of time. Thank you. Thank you for running us through actually those criteria that we should have in mind when we look at um, facial recognition and face surveillance. Um, I would like to move now to uh, you, Hudi, uh, with our author from uh, the Northeastern University. I think you will give us the segue between, we've been discussing some of the risk and the way uh, facial recognition uh, technology has been used, and um, you will walk us through some of uh, the first regulatory and policy and how we could look into safeguards uh, around it. Sure. So uh, thank you very much. It's great to see you all here. Allow me to um, be blunt when talking about facial recognition because I want to be brief. Uh, I think facial recognition technology is the most dangerous surveillance technology ever invented. I think that it is so attractive to both governments and to industry to deploy it in so many different ways, and it is so ripe for abuse, and the existing mechanisms that we have are so weak to currently confront the harms that it poses that the only way to mitigate the harms is to ban it. 
And let me explain what I mean by that. So first, I think that facial recognition, to, to, to build on what Brian said, uh, facial recognition is completely unique. The world has never seen anything like it. And one of the reasons why is because there is nothing quite like our face. Our faces are very difficult to hide, unlike, say, our gait or our fingerprints, which you have to have basically relatively close contact with, um, or uh, uh, perhaps our ears or our irises, right? So there are lots of other biometrics. Um, but, but not all of them extol the cost of hiding that our faces do. And sometimes it's actually illegal to even hide our face. Um, uh, there is also an existing legacy of name face databases to draw from for facial recognition that doesn't exist for things like gait recognition, iris recognition, and other sorts of databases. And so uh, this was uh, illustrated quite clearly. Uh, someone in the previous panel mentioned the uh, story in the New York Times about Clearview, uh, which was the uh, facial recognition app that was able to scrape uh, uh, billions of photos from existing name face databases and instantly deploy them uh, for use, which, which doesn't exist, as far as I know, with any other biometric. And the third reason that facial recognition technologies are completely unique is because our faces, unlike any other part of us, probably more so than any other part of us, are what we uniquely associate with our identity, at least with, with uh, respect to our physical appearance. So many of you um, may uh, go back later, weeks from now, someone mentions, oh, uh, did you see uh, 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 someone talk at CPDP about the thing? Did you see Woody Hartog talk? The thing that you will think about is not my feet, not my hands, you will think about my face. And that makes it uniquely, um, uh, makes us uniquely vulnerable to these technologies given how central it is um, to, to our identities. Um, uh, the second point that I want to make about this, about the reason that I think that uh, a lot of the uh, regulatory mechanisms that have been proposed are not sufficient, is because there's a lot of talk around inaccuracy with facial recognition, which is a big problem. But one of the things that I hope that we don't lose sight of is that inaccuracy and bias is not the only problem that we have with facial recognition. In fact, there are many people, I've, I've sort of heard in, in casual conversation, well, if we can just sort of get it more accurate, then we'll solve a lot of the problems. I actually think that while facial recognition technology is dangerous when it is inaccurate, the more accurate it gets, the more oppressive it gets, and the more dangerous it actually becomes. Um, and the reason why, of course, I mean, so, so putting aside sort of issues of, uh, of um, bias with respect to people of color and other vulnerable populations. Um, a world in which we have a, a widespread facial recognition technologies can facilitate harassment and violence, which we've already seen. It could become very easy to stalk people um, anytime you want. We can say, oh, wow, look, I've, I've facial recognition technology has picked up this person at this cafe. If you want to uh, go find them right now, you can do so. Um, and we've seen this already play out, actually, uh, in several different areas where, where facial recognition has already been deployed. Um, it's, it, it just begs for arbitrary government tracking, right? So we may have procedural mechanisms to push against that, but every single other intuition, once we've built the surveillance infrastructure that allows for it, will we'll, we'll beg for some sort of widespread surveillance. Because once you've built the surveillance infrastructure to monitor then the next question becomes, well, why didn't you use it? If we have the ability to monitor everyone at all times, then surely we could have deployed that, right, in this instance to, for, for example, catch someone. Um, one of the reasons why I think that uh, facial recognition poses an underappreciated threat is to our practical obscurity. So uh, when a, a lot of us think about uh, notions of privacy, we often think about notions of secrecy, right, or the ability to, to sort of hide. But one of the underappreciated aspects of our privacy is what I call our obscurity, our practical obscurity. All of us exist in these zones of obscurity um, where we're unlikely to be found or understood by anyone, right? You can go to a cafe at lunch and you can gossip about your coworker because the odds are no one's going to be around to hear, right? Even though it's in public, even though we're walking around. Um, where we go from day to day is always in public, but it's not routinely being tracked and pulled together. And facial recognition threatens to eviscerate these sort of zones of practical obscurity that we've come to rely upon in adjusting our risk calculus about how we interact in day-to-day -day life. 
Um, one of the reasons that I think that facial recognition is, is uh, the dangers of facial recognition is underappreciated is because it's the gateway technology for the personal data industrial complex. So one of the things that we've seen is that facial recognition is being deployed in all different kinds of ways to extract all different kinds of personal information and to facilitate lots of systems that sort of further what has been called surveillance capitalism, right? So now we're using it to board flights and we're using it to pay for goods, right? Which I'll strictly to say isn't necessary to, to, to transact those things, but because it's easy, but because we can do it, we roll it out. And like death from a thousand cuts, every time we roll it out, there's a little more data that's collected and a little more data that's collected. And the frameworks that we have right now don't necessarily take an assessment for each small, little, individual transaction. But collectively, it will feed a massive growth in overall personal data collection, even if it is done fairly and in accordance with the GDPR. Um, uh, and so finally, the, the, one of the real things that I, I tend to worry a lot about with respect to facial recognition is the idea that once we have it, it allows us to enforce laws and norms almost perfectly, right, and at low cost. So jaywalking uh, is not a thing that we enforce regularly, right, so uh, yet if you have facial recognition technology, it might be easy to see who's jaywalking. We're seeing this actually being deployed in some countries where if you steal, for example, multiple rolls of toilet paper, all of a sudden, you've been demerited, right? Uh, the laws that we have on the books right now were written uh, in, a, in a time where we didn't envision them being enforced perfectly, 100% of the time. But if we have the technology to do so, then it becomes really difficult to say, well, we shouldn't enforce that perfectly 100% of the time, or at least you have to have a very good reason to sort of resist that. Um, and so the final reason that I think uh, uh, we should be having this conversation about possible bans and moratoriums as a way to explore facial recognition technologies because the traditional remedies, uh, in my opinion, frankly, aren't going to work. Um, warrant requirements, for example, for government surveillance can be useful, but they're often granted, right? And, and consents, if you want consents, you're probably going to get it. And the odds of that being meaningful by someone who has clicked uh, seemingly millions of I agree buttons on the internet and can't remember a single one of them. Right? The odds that the consent that we grant for that kind of surveillance is going to be meaningful, um, in, in my opinion, is, is very low. Um, and so the regulatory mechanisms that we're deploying now are things that, that already have major, I, I think, faults about them. And so to, to sort of embrace them more broadly and to think that they can solve um, a, a, a problem uh, that is more dangerous than I think anything we've ever seen, I think is, is, um, is really problematic. So um, in the interest of time, I'll stop there uh, and we can talk about discussions later, but that's what I wanted to say now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think your, your call and your explanation from Ben was, was really clear, which is um, a good opportunity, I guess, for our last speaker, Frank Torres from Microsoft, to also respond to You've heard our calls for ban, you've heard our discussion about the risk that this technology um, posed to, um, to different human rights. And so, as a representative from a company who um, built this type of technology and also put forward some regulatory proposals around that, um, what would be your answer to those issues? Great, and, and before I do that, I actually have a, a confession to make. Um, as my uh, colleague, Cornelia, uh, reminds me constantly, it's taken her 10 years to get me to come to this conference. To be honest, I don't know what took me so long. I was actually, back in the day, uh, chairperson of the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference in the United States, not once but twice. Um, I don't understand how that happened, but um, I, I certainly appreciate and understand the importance of these sorts of dialogues, um, even more so moving forward. Um, you know, we need views like Woody's, we need views uh, like the other panelists, and we need your views um, to be heard, not just by governments anymore, but by companies. And while we may disagree with uh, kind of the, you know, the, the, the path followed, we certainly appreciate and understand the challenges, the risk, the misuse, the abuse um, that, the, that the technology 
uh, can have. Um, you know, I think a lot of the concerns that Woody raises um, are concerns I've heard raised about technology generally through the years. Um, uh, some good, some bad. Uh, some are controlled by, uh, or the risk mitigated, um, or use restricted uh, by laws and the enforcement of those laws. Um, I think some might argue that even with the passage of GDPR, you're still going to have violations of people's privacy rights, despite the passage and, and hopefully good enforcement uh, of laws like that. And so I think the question becomes, um, you know, when it comes to the banner moratorium, do you just, you know, kind of say, okay, for, first of all, there's probably no or, or very slight beneficial uses, or certainly the beneficial uses uh, don't outweigh uh, the risk, and that there's no law that can be put in place that could actually help mitigate the issue, prohibit the issue, restrict bad uses. So at Microsoft, um, you know, and our president of our company um, just had a few remarks about this. He said, listen, you know, th th this, this is one where, you know, let's take a look. Uh, let's really identify the problems. Let's get rules in place. And he was an, an early caller um, over a year ago calling for regulation of, of facial recognition, and let's work to get rules put in place. And actually, when you take a look, and I was so happy, actually, when Public Voices um, and, and the hundreds of uh, organizations and academics and others who signed on to that did what they did. I mean, we may, may disagree with a moratorium or a ban, but we certainly agree with everything that was in there concerning, okay, but moratorium until these things have to be put in place, uh, especially bef before this should be used uh, for mass surveillance. Things like an independent evaluation, um, public dialogue, a democratic discourse, um, review of the data, an assessment of risk, a look at the ethics and establishing rules and standards that govern this. I mean, people need to, first of all, to be aware that this sort of technology is, is being used, have a voice in it, and then um, the governments need to put the rules in place. So at Microsoft, um, we came up with these principles over a year ago. And some of us, um, not just me, but others, said, okay, principles are great, but what does this mean? What does this mean for our developers? What does this mean for, you know, the rest of the company? I mean, sure, it makes everybody feel warm and fuzzy, perhaps, but how do we essentially operationalize this? What does it mean for what we do as a company and, and what we do with our customers and what do we expect of them? This is unlike, you know, we're at, at, a, at kind of a, a growing cusp here when it comes to technology. Today it's going to be facial recognition. Tomorrow it's going to be other things, right? So, so does this set, you know, a model for us to move forward with where it can't just be principles. It's got to be what you do in practice. And then if that's not enough, and oftentimes it may not be, what sort of laws do, do we put in place? And, and so we came up with some principles, not just what we do, but to just help us decide who we would provide this technology to. And in fact, that led us to telling a law enforcement agency in the United States, you shouldn't be using this on body cams. You shouldn't be using facial recognition. The risk is too great, um, you know, especially if, there, you know, one mistake and, and, it's, and it could lead to disastrous consequences. So, so no use for that. Um, there was a government that did not respect human rights following Freedom House and other, other metrics of, you know, experts that, that determine that. So we said, we won't sell that. It was a deal that we said no to. Um, following our principles, putting them into practice. Uh, you know, things like, you know, and we call them acceptable uses. Um, things like, you know, how, how do we kind of measure and look at fairness? Um, is it transparent? What sort of accountability is there? Is there non-discrimination, respect for human rights? Um, what sort of notice and, and consent are being used? And then that got turned into kind of a, a legislative proposal that, that we're still refining. We don't pretend to have all of the answers um, here uh, by any means. And that, again, that's why this sort of discussion we think is so important. Um, you know, for, one of the big things that, that we say is, uh, you know, there ought to be testing and not just by you, company X, Y, or Z. You've got to put out your APIs or put out some other technical capability that a third party can test for bias and fairness. Um, uh, that 
you as a developer have to have some responsibility, and we take this on ourselves, to make sure that people understand the capabilities and limitations of the technology. As NIST uh, you know, came out in their recent report, kind of saying there's still a lot of inaccuracies, they also said two important things. One is, but not all, all al different algorithms behave differently, so some actually have increased in accuracy over time, um, but perhaps also equally as important is you have to look at the context, right? If, if the algorithm that you're using um, isn't appropriate for the, the particular use, you shouldn't be using it. If you're getting crappy results, you shouldn't be using it. So you should also do not just kind of the benchmark testing, but operational testing. And of course, the more cons potentially consequential the decision, the more you have to decide, should you be using this at all? Um, which is a great question that anybody using technology these days should probably ask. Um, you know, should you be using it at all? Do I need facial recognition to tell me somebody's age if I'm an insurance company or someone else where that may matter? Um, you know, do I need it for that or should I just ask the person their age? Um, uh, you know, in commercial settings, um, if you're gonna enroll an image in a database, get consent. I know, the, you know, there's lots of arguments about how you do that, but, you know, you sign up for a VIP program, you sign up for a loyalty card, if you're inclined to do that, you get the person's consent before you do that. You know, the, the, the same should hold here. There should be rights around that. If I want to take my image out of the database, I should be allowed to do that. Um, there ought to be training, um, whether law enforcement, especially for law enforcement use. There was a law enforcement uh, association that testified um, in the House of Representatives last year and basically said when asked, yeah, we get this, you know, some, some uh, 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 law enforcement agencies get this technology because they, they've heard that it could potentially be useful, but the officers that are using it haven't been trained on how to use it. it doesn't make any sense to me. There should absolutely be a training requirement before the technology uh, could be used, if it should be used at all in, in, in those cases. There should be an accountability report. It shouldn't be, it should be clear to the communities where this technology is being used that it's going to be used before it's gonna be used. And, and so one of the things we call for is months before it's used, you know, law enforcement agencies not only have to alert the community, talk about the vendor, talk about the testing that they've done, talk about the purpose, provide all those details, but also provide the opportunity for communities to have input. Um, and, 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 you know, persuade, uh, you know, if, if they want to push for a ban, to, to work through their um, legislative uh, folks to, to do that. Um, uh, so, so, so there's that. Um, uh, we, we think that there ought to be due process, that at a minimum there ought to be a warrant uh, before you use it uh, for mass surveillance. Uh, but more importantly, there should be restrictions on, you know, using it for those purposes. And certainly, you know, you can't use it again, you shouldn't use it, or well, you should be prohibited from using it, you know, where, where it's, you know, religious affiliation or other um, uh, uh, kind of characteristics, sexual orientation, ethnicity, when those factors come into play, you just shouldn't be allowed to use it. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that, that's where we are today. Um, we can talk more uh, as the discussion progresses about kind of the state of play on, uh, you know, how far these things are going. Uh, you know, it's my understanding, though, that, uh, you know, some more and more uh, entities uh, are, are uh, you know, kind of on their own pressing a little pause button. Uh, it's my understanding. Certainly, a lot of people are putting out principles. They're really contemplating how they use it. Um, you know, we get, when we listen to folks, um, you know, both sides, we get people that, you know, groups that are saying, you know, ban's the only way or some sort of moratorium before things get put in place. And then we, do, there are people on the other side, organizations on the other side saying, oh, laws will just mess up our ability to use it. Um, and, but I think those, you know, that's just, that day is long gone. Um, you know, it's clear that there's lots of interest, um, you know, in different, uh, both, uh, at least in Washington, D.C., uh, by the U.S. Congress, uh, states in the United States are also starting to act. And so I, th I think we'll see um, a lot of activity and, and potentially some laws passed uh, before too long. Thank you. We'll now move to the discussion part um, of the session. So I'll invite uh, anyone who has a question to stand up behind the mic. Um, and maybe to get things started, actually, I would have a question 
probably more directed to you, Frank, but to everyone on the panel. We've been discussing how difficult it is to actually have um, um, a debate on those issues once the technology are developed and put in place. Because as we mentioned, when it's here, it creates the interest of like, great, let's use it for A, B, C, D. Um, and Frank, you've mentioned that a lot of discussion needs to happen prior, actually, and even development phase on those technologies, given um, the risk that also has been raised. So shouldn't there be actually part of all of those principles, a decision from the companies to actually not develop those technologies until we've all had, had this discussion on whether or not we want to use it? Well, I mean, each, each company is going to have to decide kind of what they want to do. Um, you know, we certainly um, have taken to heart uh, not just around facial recognition, uh, but AI uh, more broadly. Uh, we have created uh, what we call the Ether Committee. Um, please don't ask me what it stands for, but it's essentially um, the, 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 the committee uh, from across the company um, to take a look and provide guidance on um, uh, how we develop and deploy artificial intelligence, asking the tough ethical questions, which include, you know, should we even be doing this? Uh, you know, that, 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 that comes up a lot. But then, you know, what also comes up is, okay, suppose we stop making facial recognition technology. Suppose we just stop. Somebody else is going to do it, and it's still going to be put out there. Um, and so, uh, you know, how, how do we take it a step further, look more at what we do, um, get our, you know, ethical house, if you will, uh, in order, um, you know, influence our customers, um, but then also push for laws and regulations so it, it applies to the entirety. But you're right, it, it's, you know, once the technology is out there, it's difficult to put the genie back in the bottle, um, but, but we've got to try and make the effort. I just wanted to make a quick comment that that's one of the reasons why ACM and others have begun to, to direct more attention to creating codes of ethics and professional conduct because there will always be gaps in which the law has not yet caught up with the emerging technology. Um, but also to the point that Estelle has made in that there needs to be a process that began from the very beginning. Is there something that is not going to do harm to individuals who are using this? This is something that has potentially greater societal good or harm that we need to consider. What do we consider when we recognize that this is an integral part of a political system or a societal system and so forth? So these are the kinds of questions that are, you might say, abstract but generalizable enough. So it may not be about facial recognition specifically, or it should be when that technology emerges but having something that can persist until specific law is put in place is one helpful solution. I'm sure Woody has something to say about that too. So I'd like to, to say two things. One would be about the, the cost of, of implementing something like a ban or a moratorium, because it is difficult, because one of the, the objections that I often hear is, well, we're already, we're already rolling out this technology. We're using this thing. And there's sort of an inevitability narrative that is forming around this, which is, well, you can't stop this, this train. You can't ban math, for example, right? You can't put this thing back in the bottle. But I, I, don't, I don't buy that argument. We used to make cars that were death traps. We used to make drugs that were incredibly dangerous. We used to sell lawn darts, right? Uh, and we create laws to sort of mitigate against a lot of those things. And we can create laws to mitigate against this. Will it come at a cost? Absolutely. But I think that the cost is worth it. Um, and then the other thing I, I, I want to, to talk about with respect to your point, which is the, the idea of, of techno technologically neutral laws versus technologically specific laws. Another pushback that I regularly get is, well, we shouldn't create just laws banning facial recognition because next week it's going to be gait recognition, and then there's going to be a laser that can sensor that can identify you from your heartbeat, which actually may already exist. Um, and uh, and so why would we ban one thing? It's going to end up being sort of a, 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 a endless whack-a-mole. Um, to, to that point, I would respond, A, you have to start somewhere, right? And, and actually, 
one of the things that a ban or a moratorium on facial recognition could do is be a truly meaningful step outside of the proceduralistic notions that we have really ingrained lately over the past 20 years of privacy and surveillance regulation. That's largely ask people's consents, do risk assessments, but all in all, whatever you want to do, we will find a way to massage to make it happen. And for a lot of technologies, that may be good. But I don't know if it holds true for every single technology. And that this could be a blueprint of a way for us to think about substantive prohibitions and regulations on technology that will guide us away from the technologies that ultimately will do more harm than good and drive us towards the technologies that we say would have a net benefit. But, but, but I accept all, all, all those points, except you, you said something very uh, interesting, and that was, you know, you, you cited the, the, the dangerous cars or the dangerous drugs, right? We put in laws that essentially ban the dangerous drugs, ban the dangerous cars, but we didn't ban cars and we didn't ban drugs. You know, so, uh, you know, th th there's laws around that. You know, F the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, and I'm sure the equivalents here, um, agencies here uh, in Europe and elsewhere, you know, take a look at that and take it very seriously in their certification process. There's other things, you know, certainly with toxic chemicals. I think it's reach and real uh, here in, in Europe. It's TOSCA, this Toxic Substance and Abuse Act, uh, 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 and Use Act in, in the United States that doesn't say you can't use toxic chemicals. Some, some of them actually have a beneficial function but it limits the import. You've got to certify. You've got to say how you use it. You have to put protections in place. Some chemicals are banned, um, you know, when it comes to that. And so it's, you know, call it what you will, a more nuanced approach, um, uh, perhaps, but, you know, but nonetheless, what you, your point's extremely well taken. You know, we can't take this sort of technology lightly. Um, there might be some uses that are completely inappropriate and ought to be prohibited, um, uh, but other uses, you know, may be okay, because they bring some benefit, authentication or, or something else. Sure, and I totally agree, and I, I didn't mean to, 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 I think that perhaps we're, we're saying a lot of the same thing. So uh, when we say we, you know, proposing bans on facial recognition, what we're not proposing bans on is all biometrics necessarily, right, or all surveillance technologies necessarily, but rather um, what I'm hoping to avoid is the, is the sort of category mistake where we, where we say, um, you know, all facial recognition technology um, you know, should be allowed because we don't want to ban one specific technology, whereas we do have examples where we sort of single out particular technologies. Valeria. Yes, I'd like to add that we, with the legal claim that we presented, that I talked about moments ago, we are trying to make a practical approach to banning the use of the system. Why? Because and of course, we are concerned also of the use that private companies make of that. In fact, uh, people that are following our work uh, question us, what about the use of facial recognition by the banks, by private companies? Okay, but the point is, if the state in a uh, security or criminal relation in using of the police, in the power of policy, which put the citizen in a very, very fragile balance in, in, in the relationship, is the weak part, does not understand the implications of the adoption of facial recognition, because again, in the case of City of Buenos Aires, which have, in other matters, very advanced policies, in this case, makes it, it similar, the, the, um, the narrative with the CCTV system using it like an image. So what can we expect from the state, from the judges, from the legislators to put in front of companies and claim what is correct or make the kind of questions that uh, there were talk here? So again, in, in we were uh, we were we signed the um, the public voice petition. In fact, what we are trying to do with our legal approach and our practical approach is to ban the system in the city of Buenos Aires. We think it, it, it's a way to highlight the necessity of, ha of of having clear policies, clear conversations, clear diagnosis. If this very intrusive uh, tool is necessary, at least in public space. For, a start, for starting in some place. Thank you. I think what you point out also here is obviously we talk about government use of that, but there is companies behind it, and it's 
just one of the other areas where we see this public-private partnership between companies and government in deployment on TUC that is being put there and some of the deployment of this technology or proposal of deployment is technology that we've seen also in Europe. Um, I can't really say that the companies have been always very transparent, neither with the people who is going to be um, in front of the camera nor, um, nor the public institution. Um, I come from France and in the south of France, in public school, um, a company offered to test their technology for free, meaning training their system on, on kids, in order to, put their to deploy their technology in public school so they could uh, control better which kid is at school and which kid is not at school. There is a discussion on whether or not we can do that differently, but there, is also, there was also no explanation to the school that it's for free because really you're helping us making this technology better, but there, because there was no understanding on that. So there is so much more scrutiny that needs to happen on so many levels on that, and we're just being used, frankly, as guinea pigs um, at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it really builds the question. It's not just facial recognition, but again, because of the risk that it poses, um, how to create that debate when the technology are being used and people need us to test it is really, uh, it's really difficult to, to see how that's happening. Um, I want to reiterate, Michael, and encourage you to come and uh, ask our panelists questions. And you can see we can cover quite uh, a lot of ground, but I also saw a couple of you pick up your mics in case you have additional comments um, on the cases we mentioned. Um, it's one of the, the, f the few area where we're discussing a lot at this, uh, at this conference, so we see really the, um, the interest in that, Valeria. Yeah. I could say that, at least so far, we are following this issue a lot, not only in Latin America or in Argentina, but globally. And I might say, humbly and concerning, that the ones that are uh, putting the red lines on this issue are civil society organizations and academia. A state is implementing without proper diagnosis in most of cases. Yeah, I'm providing general um, statements here. Maybe there are um, governments that are implementing this kind of, of technology in a proper way. But uh, that is why it's important that we here talk about this and understand the risks and share this in our spaces, in our everyday spaces, mm -hmm. and highlight the red lights. On, on this to give proper discussions. Since we covered the issue from different regions, I think many of us follow development in other areas also. Have you seen any decision from specific cities, specific governments, specific countries that you think can particularly impact the debate or they were um, relevant um, in, in the case of the deployment and the use of, of these technologies because we're seeing um, sometimes more at local level decision happening faster than, uh, than at states? I don't know if any of you have a comment on that. Yeah, so I think that, that one of the interesting things that we've seen developing within the past year is that cities within the United States have taken the decision to ban uh, the procurement and use of facial recognition technologies by the government. In cities in uh, Massachusetts, Cambridge, and Somerville uh, have banned facial recognition. In California, the cities of San Francisco and Oakland have banned it. And now we've begun to seeing, we're seeing this now actually rise up a little to the state level where bills are being introduced and debated. One of the most interesting bills just got introduced in the state of Washington a few days ago where they proposed uh, banning um, AI profiling in public places, which would apply to lots of different, uh, including facial recognition, um, uh, as well as different kinds of, of, of profiling in very particular sorts of settings. Um, and, and, and they were, they were uh, w w without sort of the, the notions of consent or things, just outright sort of prohibitions. And, and we're seeing that happen. And so it's a place to watch at the local level, at least within the United States for the next year. The, and and the, the, the piece that I think is going to get very interesting, and, and I think the EU report, the, the, the draft report that, that was released or leaked, um, you know, kind of calls this out too. It, you know, it says, well, you know, l l l l let's take a look at the, you know, how GDPR applies. And it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how does the California law, which is really, you know, turned into the law in the United States now, um, you know, how does that apply to something like profiling? Um, and, and how does the, 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 the two get reconciled? And is, um, you know, the Congress debates a, a, a federal privacy bill um, you know, what does that look like? I know in Washington state there's also an underlying state bill 
um, you know, that deals with privacy generally and then talks about facial and then th th there's bills on facial recognition as well. I think Lauren has a comment here and your point also, um, I mean, we all here care about data protection. We work a lot on those issues, but I wonder if actually it's not an area where data protection law is just not enough uh, because the model is different. It's based on large consent, which is not enforced properly. Uh, it's based on trying to give user control through other way also, like data protection by design and our system, but is it something that can truly be achieved um, through, through this technology? Sorry. Well, I, I don't think it's so much achieved through the technology. It's, you know, before you could, you know, if, if it relies on data, if, it, if you fall under the scope of the particular law, whether it be GDPR or something else, I, I think it doesn't matter what sort of technology you're, you're using, it, you've got to comply with the law however you need to comply with it. And I'll just sort of say, while data protection, I think, has, models have a lot to offer, I don't think it's enough to, to fully combat facial recognition. Uh, one of the many reasons why is it's because of this sort of focus on control and, and sort of individualized autonomy interests, which of course are important, but uh, facial recognition also jeopardizes a lot more sort of collective societal interests. The data protection just isn't the ideal engine to try to address, I think. Lauren. Yeah, I just want to raise the question to Woody and really anybody else on the panel. When we talk about some of the differences I've seen in terms of emerging approaches, um, whether it's a ban or not ban, or if it's a ban for a limited time, I think we get back to the point that I think a number of us have raised in which the risks are so high, whether it's privacy risk, security risk, human rights violation risk, the risk is so high that we feel that it's not yet time. Is that the approach? So it's essentially temporary until manufacturers and companies can verify that they can meet a certain threshold, or is it just forever? Stop all development, let's move, let's move on to something different. So if I'm making the argument, then it's an outright ban, and mm -hmm. it's a permanent one. Um, but that's based on my own calculus, and I realize that there's a lot of inputs that go into that. I think there are several different ways that you could actually take this approach. You could consider a moratorium outright, both for industry and government. You could do things like banning real-time surveillance. You could do things like banning the creation of name-faced databases. Specific context right. Exactly, specific mm -hmm. context and specific instances. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of different ways that I think that you could slice um, robust substantive prohibitions that would, I think, still meaningfully serve mitigating against a lot of the abuse. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the questions we have from the audience. We'll take both of them and then direct them to the panel. Thank you. Hello, I'm from the Dutch Prosecution Office, and I would very much like to know, um, uh, well, in Europe we have the GDPR, we have the European Directive on uh, Law Enforcement, and we would like to know if in Argentina, um, uh, uh, you have um, contact with the European Commission uh, because in Argentina there is an adequacy decision of the European Commission for Argentina. And if you do have any contact on this development of uh, f uh, facial uh, recognition. And also I would like to, like to know if there are any contacts in, uh, uh, of the US government um, with the European Commission in this uh, kind of developments because Thank you. of the adequacy decisions. Yeah? Thank you. We'll take the two other questions, uh, if you don't mind, and then um, we'll have um, Valeria answer the first part. And then. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Charles Robb from the University of Edinburgh and the Alan Turing Institute. Um, I think this has been a very impressive panel, which kind of runs the spectrum from skepticism to uh, abhorrence. Um, I want to pose a thing to you because I think that it's sort of the political situation which has been left out of this. Um, many states, many governments, many police forces will say that public safety and security is their number one concern and that is their number one value. They may say that privacy and autonomy and fairness are also important but it doesn't outweigh safety and security. And there are a lot of people in the public who go along with that. I'm not saying they should, but they do. And therefore, when you're a government and you're in power, and if you have a fairly impregnable majority, 
You might well say, well, um, okay, facial recognition might not be proven, might not be accurate, it might not even be effective, but people think so. They may be, they may be misled into thinking so, just like people when CCTV was introduced thought that it deterred crime until research studies showed that it really doesn't very much deter crime. So what do you do in deploying counter-arguments against the safety and security rhetoric, which I think in some countries is extremely powerful. Safety and security against crime, against terrorism, against all kinds of other things that are branded as safety issues. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the last question as well. Thank you. Hello, Tobias Moschus from Datenschutzraum Germany. My question, you said uh, one of the problems is that it is hidden. You don't see that facial recognition is done. And the question is, is it enough to ban facial recognition or do we have to go a step further and do a ban on uh, cameras uh, in public places because uh, I can, you can hide a camera but uh, it's much easier to detect a camera or to see uh, uh, that there is a camera then to see if someone is using facial recognition uh, legally, illegally, or if the data is stored uh, and someone does it 10 years later. Thank you. I will invite each of you to provide some comments to the question, but starting with Valeria, since there was um, a comment directly to you, and this will also serve as a, your uh, concluding remarks. Very quickly, yes, Argentina has the adequacy recognition since 2003. We know that we are currently, as a country, under revision by the European Commission. In fact, we as a civil society organization are in contact with the authorities. We provide our in input directly to them. The thing here is that the facial recognition system is local, it's not a national level, it's in the city of Buenos Aires. Argentina is a federal country, so this can be not an obstacle because the law is, is for all, but it has its particularities. Uh, but we um, put, it, not the European Commission exactly uh, under the radar of this, but to the UN Commissioner of, of Privacy who was visiting Argentina last year, and in fact, he, in his uh, report, he underlined that the system, the facial recognition system in the city of Buenos Aires is no proportionate, uh, g given the facts that he analyzed that are in, the, in his report. In, I will not uh, provide detail because of time, just highlight this. And regarding uh, public safety, of course, is the narrative that we faced uh, every time, and it's a legitimate narrative, but the first thing that we remark is that, at least in the case that we are fighting, uh, there is no narrative in the opposite, you know? There was no proper balance for, uh, from the government to analyze this, to analyze the, um, the, the impacts on data protection, the impacts on uh, privacy, on other human rights. In Latin America, in Argentina in particular, maybe, if, I don't know how much do you know about our history to invoke, public safety or national security is not that easy because we have a very sad past of dictatorship that still make noise in all of us because this was the narrative that sustained the dictatorships. In fact, it's appearing also in another countries of the region that are, are having uh, civil uh, bursts, civil uh, claims of the citizens in a very strong way. And at the end of the day, it's a political decision. It's always political there, and also business, because somebody provides the system. And I think that um, it's not the same, or th there is uh, a difference between the CCTV system, and I maybe are simplifying this too much, and it requires more elaboration, that the facial recognition use the CCTV system is it's, it's a means to an end. The CCTV system, and as is regulated so far, it's an end in itself. So I think that we have to differentiate that to start dig more in depth. 
Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine. So I'm going to give three very brief answers to, I think, all three questions, and they probably will be unsatisfactory, but just in the interest of time. The first question, I think, had to do with dialogues that are global. In which ways are the US speaking with Europe, with Latin America, and so forth? And so I'll just make a quick comment, at least from a personal standpoint, that that was one of the reasons that the T Technology Policy Council at ACM was created this year, to recognize that we are living in a global ecosystem and the necessity to uh, approach these not only from regional legislative frameworks, but also think about what the global implications are is essential. The second question, you're absolutely right about the political and uh, social uh, implications of this. Uh, my, my point would be public safety is, is clearly, and national security um, clearly has um, always outweighed, and particularly different in different countries, but in the, in the United States, for example, outweigh the, uh, the need for individual privacy. Um, but I think one helpful narrative, as Valeria was saying, is to um, talk about fundamental human rights. But fundamental human rights as a collective good that is in our interest to ensure that collectively, as a community, as a society, and so forth, that these are human rights that need to be attended to. They are just as important as ensuring the security and the safety of the public. And in fact, they encompass safety and security in them. The last question had to do with whether hidden and lack of visibility of cameras or recognition systems is an important point. There's um, decades of research in sociology as well as um, philosophy and theories about the pernicious threat that comes when you are uncertain about being surveilled and whether you, when you cannot see, but you know that there's a possibility of being surveilled, essentially you make an assumption that you are constantly being surveilled. So the fact that it is hidden does have a behavioral as well as a sociological effect. And we know that from sociology research as well as uh, philosophy, Foucault's uh, Bentham's panopticon. Is one way of looking at that. I'm sorry, so I will stop you here. We unfortunately have to stop because I'm there sorry. is an award ceremony that do? has uh, to start. I'll just abuse my moderating power for to give each of you 30 seconds to try to do something, um, to try to answer some of the questions. Frank. Okay, I'm not sure about US government engagement. I think NIST may be um, engaging, but not sure, but can find out more. Um, to the question of uh, law enforcement, Public safety and security, while important, don't trump other things like human rights, following the rules. There should be rules put in place before the technology gets used. And absolutely, transparency is fundamental. Um, you know, notice uh, and, and accountability is just part of the overall solution, but people need to be aware of what's happening to them. Thank you. And I'll just end by trying to answer all the questions all at once by saying, I actually think that the transparency and notice and choice and consent are broken regulatory mechanisms for these digital technologies and that the way forward is actually to convince people that privacy is essential to their lives and to make it real for them. Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking our panel today.